What's up, rockers? Today we're going back in time. The year is 2004, and the GameCube has been out for three years, and there were no mod chips available for the GameCube. The modding scene for the OG Xbox and PS2 was exploding, with all kinds of amazing mods, from mod chips to actual console replacement shells. Now mind you, this was in the era of pre-soft mods, so if you wanted to be able to play homebrew and backups, mod chips were the only avenue to do so. However, in late 2004, announcements for several new mod chips were made for the GameCube, including the release of the first ever mod chip for the GameCube, the Viper GC. The Viper GC is an IPL replacement based mod chip that allows users to direct boot games and run homebrew from memory. Prior to this, it was possible to run backups on the GameCube, but the process was complicated and relied on the broadband adapter and an exploit in Fantasy Star Online. While the process is outside of the scope of this video, it was not easy to say the least, and it wasn't an option that was really available to masses. Now getting back to the Viper GC, while it was first a market and chock full of features, there was a major drawback to it. It relied on the parallel port to program it. Let that sink in for a minute. In 2004, the parallel port was dead and USB had become the de facto standard. As a matter of fact, USB 1.1 was supported on Windows 95. Again, why are we using a parallel port in 2004? However, in March 2005, two new mod chips were announced. The Ripper 3 on March 18th, and the Cube Pro was announced on March 21st. The Ripper 3 was not very interesting for all intents and purposes, as it was just a clone of the aforementioned Viper GC. The Cube Pro, on the other hand, was an evolutionary step ahead of the Viper GC in pretty much every way. In addition to having USB functionality, it also supported up to 32 applications loaded on its 16 megabits of flash memory, progressive video, network support, in-game reset, and tons of customization options available. This became the go-to mod chip for the scene and it sold very well as a result. Now one of the major drawbacks to the GameCube was its use of mini DVDs instead of the full-size counterpart used in both the Xbox and the PS2. Well, no worries, because Cube had your back there too. During holiday of 2005, they introduced a bundle which included the Cube Pro mod chip and a replacement top shell that supports full-size DVDs. So in this video, let's check out that bundle, install it into the GameCube, and relive what it was like modding the GameCube during 2005. So I've got this nice jet black GameCube. This is a Japanese GameCube, and I mean, honestly, it needs a little retro bright and a little bit of love, but hey, it's a prime candidate for a mod like this. So you can see as I pop open the two tops on these two tops that uh, obviously the disc size is a little different. And clearly, as I demonstrate here with the full size disc, it clearly doesn't fit into the, you know, legacy GameCube case, but it does fit quite nicely into the replacement. Now, unfortunately, when they made the replacement, there were certain sacrifices that had to be made, and the number one thing that they had to sacrifice is the power LED indicator. So we're going to have to make some modification for that and probably just do an LED mod as a result. Taking a look at the actual mod chip itself, it was pretty ingeniously designed, and the way they designed it actually doesn't cut off any airflow to the uh, actual system. And you'll kind of see when we install it a little later on how that design worked and why it worked so well. But yeah, after taking a look at the uh, top and the mod chip here, let's go ahead and get this console ripped open and let's start to get all this stuff installed. Now, for whatever it's worth, I'm extremely nostalgic for this particular mod. And the reason why is back in 2006, I modded my childhood GameCube with a Cube Probe mod chip. And this is actually gonna be the first time I've installed one of these mod chips since 2006. So it's incredibly exciting to finally have one of these in my hands again, and even better, it's more exciting that I'll be able to finally be able to add a console with a Q Pro mod chip to my collection. So anyway, let's just continue to rip this thing open and get into the guts of the console. All right, with that console finally ripped apart, I'm gonna start over here and we're gonna install a region switch. And this will basically allow us to swap the BIOS between either US or Japanese. 
It's incredibly important we do this because obviously this is a Japanese console and, well, clearly I want to be able to read what's going on. But what's more important is, and the reason why you would do this mod to begin with, is without doing this, my US and American, you know, saves from my memory cards unfortunately don't work. So this is an incredibly important step if you're importing consoles or doing anything like that, which is to switch the BIOS to US. In general, this is an extremely easy mod to do. The only difficult part is installing that first wire you just saw me install because the solder points are really, really small. Best thing I can recommend is just use plenty of flux and uh, yeah, make sure you get a good solid connection on your wire. As for the switch, it's really small and it kind of just fits in between the slats that sit below both the AV port and the digital port. So we'll just be able to add a little bit of glue back there and it'll hold the switch in place and we can easily toggle it between US or Japanese BIOS. So while doing that mod, I couldn't help but notice just how dirty the board is. A lot of the connectors and stuff like that are just really nasty. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use some deoxid on there, get everything really cleaned up and make it as fresh and new as possible. In general, the board's pretty dirty too. I mean, hopefully you wouldn't have to go through all these refurbishing steps if it was 2005, but hey, the reality is, is I don't have a time machine. So let's get this stuff all cleaned up. As far as installing the mod chip goes, it comes with a really convenient wiring harness and it's only a six wire install. It's really not too bad. The, the, the actual like solder points aren't that small uh, with the exception of the five volt. And I'm not gonna lie, I probably made my life a little bit more difficult than the five volt installation, which is the red wire coming up here. And I opted to solder it to a test pad as opposed to just soldering it to the capacitor that was located right next to it. So if you're doing this yourself, uh, you might make your, your life a little bit easier and solder directly to the capacitor instead of going to the test pad, which is where I soldered it. But yeah, just going to go ahead and get all these wires all cut as short as I possibly can, all these conductors, and yeah, get everything soldered in for the, the wiring harness. Now, unfortunately, this console's had oh, just a little bit of yellowing happening to it, so what I'm going to do is spend a little bit of extra time and disassemble this the whole way and I'm gonna go ahead and do some retro right onto this faceplate. Unfortunately, it's just not in great shape, so I'm thinking, you know, maybe 48 hours or so in the retro bright bath should really do a lot to make it look a lot better. So what I'm gonna do is apply some of this Salon Care Cream 40 that I've got, I get from Sally Beauty, and I'm gonna apply that on here and use a paintbrush to like really get it into all the grooves and all the nooks and crannies of the actual faceplate and seal it up in a Ziploc bag. If you're interested in a more detailed guide on retro writing, make sure to check out the card in the upper right hand corner. And that's the exact process I'm going to use, sans the heating element. Well, as long as the front of that controller is in the retro bright box, I figure I might as well do an LED mod to the front controller ports. This is actually even more important in this scenario because of that top not having a power LED indicator. So unfortunately that's one of the things that they had to get rid of in order to accommodate the full size DVD. So this is actually to me really important because you're definitely going to want to know the console is turned on. Now I'm not going to go super deep into the detail here as it relates to the entire process, but uh, what I will say is if you're interested in the upper right hand corner, I'll put a link to a full tutorial that I've made on LED modding your GameCube controller ports. So I'll leave that up there for you to check out if you're interested. As long as I'm in here, I'm going to do some preventative maintenance as well. And the preventative maintenance entails removing this CR2032 battery, and I'm going to replace it with a removable one. So this is pretty simple to do, and basically what I do is just desolder the actual CR2032 battery with a little bit of solder braid and some flux and obviously my soldering iron to take that thing out. And we're just going to install a new one that can make it so we can easily swap in and out batteries. Now, as far as LEDs go, I'm kind of thinking what I'm going to do is go with a nice little orange. It kind of should match the black and obviously the cube logo, which is a like orange, black, and silver. So I think it's going to look really good. One thing to note is you're kind of watching me do this. I've already pre-applied flux to all of the points on here. And the other thing is, is I'm just kind of tacking everything in place. These aren't my final solder joints. So typically the way I like to do it is tack everything in place and then I'll come back over everything and make a final joint. So what that means is 
get everything where it needs to be, and then I can hold everything clearly in place and then reapply some more solder and heat obviously both the wire and the pad at the same time. While I've omitted that step from the video, it's just something that I thought was worth pointing out as I've done that for virtually every single solder joint that I've performed so far. Okay, about 48 hours later, the faceplate of the controller ports is looking really good and we can just go ahead and get this thing reinstalled. It's real simple, just install those two screws and we should be pretty much all set. But uh, with that complete, I think it's time to actually reassemble the console. One of the really cool things about the Cube Pro is it has a USB adapter for it. And the original developers wanted you to be able to have the mod chip in the console and still be able to connect it via USB to your computer. So most people install this into the Game Boy Advance player port and that's really not something I want to do because obviously I want to have the Game Boy Advance on there. So I'm going to go ahead and install it here into serial port 1. It's a little bit extra work to do all the cable routing but uh, to me it's worth it. The last step of getting all this installed is obviously connecting the mod chip to the wiring harness and then hooking it up to the DVD drive which allows for the mod chip to control the open or close status of the DVD drive. From there it's just reassembly just the way we took it apart. So let's montage through the rest of this assembly and fire the console up. Okay, so now that that's all done, I've got the cube plugged into my computer. And one thing to note is when you plug this thing into your computer, do not power on the console at the same time. You just need to plug the USB cable into the cube and you should be all set. And all I'm gonna do right here is drop the BIOS onto it. So the most recent revision BIOS are 1.3C. And I'm also gonna go ahead and drop on Swiss. Now I'm not doing this the most ideal way possible. There's actually a way to do it where you can just have it direct boot into Swiss, but I'm gonna set up Swiss as a separate application merely for illustrative purposes. But uh, anyway, I've never seen any of this stuff done online, so I figured it was worth spending an extra couple minutes just kind of showing you guys what that process looked like. And incredibly, this mod chip is plug and play on Windows 10. <laughs> there was no driver required, pretty amazing. So first thing I'm gonna do is fire up the service disc. And if you're not aware, there is a Nintendo GameCube service disc. And every time you make modifications to a console, I highly recommend you run this thing. It takes about eight to 10 minutes or so to run the test. And there's a lot of flashing screens and whatnot. So for anyone who's sensitive to that, I'm just gonna skip here to the end, which says that we passed the test. And at this point, we should be good to do further testing on the console. Okay, so I've got the cube splash screen, which is just basically your 1.3 bio screen, and it kind of gives you everything you can do. Now, there's currently no disk in the system, which is why it says no medium found, but I'm gonna go ahead and launch the main menu, and from there, I'm gonna go to my applications and show you guys that you can launch Swiss from right there, and obviously you saw me load that on earlier uh, on the computer side, so let's go ahead and get Swiss launched, and uh, let's go from there. So as far as media goes, I've got an SD card loaded into the serial port 2 via the SD to SB2. If you're not familiar with what that is, uh, check out the card in the upper right hand corner. And I've also got an SD Gecko loaded into slot A. And from here I can launch all my games or my emulators or pretty much whatever I want. And before anyone gets all upset about, you know, having backup games on there, Trust me, I have a very, very extensive GameCube library and what you're seeing right now isn't even all of it, so it's pretty ridiculous. But anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and load up uh, Mario Kart Double Dash just because it's something I've been playing a lot and really enjoying. And unfortunately, uh, and my apologies, I recorded this without uh, putting in Progressive, so uh, unfortunately you guys are gonna get it in 4 EI. But nonetheless, I'm recording this uh, via the Carby, so it should look pretty good. Um, the Carby is a really nice little HDMI dongle for the GameCube and it works really well. And obviously the game worked great as uh, still can take first place in 150cc, no problem.
All right, with that out of the way, I'm now gonna go ahead and put uh, Soul Calibur 2, and I'm using a backup copy of Soul Calibur 2, and I'm just gonna load it up and boot the system, and you can see right away it says loading DVD at the bottom, which means it's just gonna go ahead and boot the disc. And it's gonna boot me directly into the game, and again, I apologize, I recorded this in 480i as well, but nonetheless, game works absolutely great and runs totally flawlessly. Now, one of the best parts about playing this game on GameCube is the fact that you can use Link. I mean, come on. Who doesn't want to use Link in a game where you have weapons-based hand-to-hand combat? I mean, quite frankly, I'm shocked that Nintendo even allowed it, but hey, it makes an already awesome game even better. But as for me, I'm just really glad to have this project done and be able to add this amazing cube to my ever-growing collection of GameCube consoles. And let's just say I've got quite a few. Anyway, if you guys modded any of these cubes back in the day, Make sure you let me know in the comments below, and if not, tell me what you thought about what it was like mining the GameCube in 2005. Anyway guys, I'll catch you for the next one here soon.